You are listening to Wednesday Wonders on the Mutual Audio Network. Be amazed. The following audio drama is rated G for general audience. can I do? Can you heal it? I asked, trying to keep the concern out of my voice. Just keep me awake. I can concentrate on healing it. How can I keep you awake? Tell me about your grand sixth cousin on your mother's side. That should take us until sunup, he said, and forced a smile. And if I start looking sleepy, just slap me in the face. I spit out a laugh. I wasn't joking about that, he said solemnly. Slap me. Don't let me sleep. So, with a shaky voice, I began to tell him tales of the antics of my grand cousin Kousi and her wayward clan. They did outrageous things just to exasperate the matriarch. These stories were favorites of Isotar's. I loved to tell them to him, and I was impressed when he would ask details about a certain fifth cousin or aunt twice removed. I was surprised he kept track of them all. Only a couple of times did I have to shake him a bit or slap at the back of his hand to rouse him into alertness. I could never bring myself to slap him in the face. By daybreak, I could tell that he was breathing easier. I don't know if because the light was brighter in the hall through the smoke hole, but his chest and sides looked less darkened with bruises. We examined his breastplate, and the denting of it looked too pinched to put on again. And that's when we got the idea of taking a breastplate from one of the taller guards that had been frozen in the hall. We couldn't pry it off because of the ice and frost that sealed it all together. And that led to the idea to place the statue figure next to the fire to melt it free. How could we know how horrific that would be? We placed the frozen body of a royal guard warrior in front of the fire pit to let the ice thaw. Then we went to scavenge about for food to make a breakfast. Arn kept a decent table in his great hall, and we were able to find something undamaged to eat. Isotar tended to my arm wound, now that he had a bit more strength. By the time he had finished, it had closed and only a dull ache remained. Feeling better about this, I went over to the royal guard we had set before the fire to see if we could coax the breastplate off the figure. Isotar! I stared in shock and horror as I looked upon the statue-like figure. The face and features of the figure were smeared down and running like a large tallow candle. His eye sockets distended down It gave him a ghoulish visage, and the fingers on the hands had dripped off, so that only stubs remained. We tried to move him away from the heat of the flames, but the sudden jostling of the body caused a sickening, shlurking sound. The torso slid off of the legs, which toppled to the floor with two dull thuds. We just looked at each other, holding the upper half of the body, carried it away from the fire pit. We managed to undo the buckles after wiping away the melted fat, which oozed over the mechanisms. We lifted the breastplate off the body with a slushing sound and lifted it over the head and finally off and away. My, my tattoos, I swear. This is some spell work, I growled. Isotar wiped clean the breastplate and began strapping into it. Let's recreate what happened here, then. Some worker of deadly spells gained access to the Great Hall, and an audience with King Arn. His royal guard still at posts along the wall, and his personal retinue on either side. As of yet, no apparent attack or threat upon entrance. This personage walked the entire length of the hall, and approached the dais without yet being challenged. Certainly some warriors would have blocked the way. 
Words were exchanged. Wir hassen, wir streiten. Das trennt uns, neigen uns. Point, Aber threat becomes das bleibt in des. And the king's guard comes in to challenge the person. What about the king? Not yet. A king stays seated while the guard move to engage in apparent threat. They are frozen in their place, the personal guard. Then the royal warriors along the wall react and draw weapons and take a step or two and are also frozen. Isatar walked up to the throne platform and faced the king's frozen form. Finally, the king himself stands up and brandishes his sword of state. His personal bodyguard and royal elite warriors all turn to ice and frost. Unafraid, he takes two and a half steps forward to meet his enemy, and himself turns soft. As Isatar chanted his narration, I could see the action while he spoke, and the figures halted in their places at the point described. It was all just as he said. Now, certainly, someone escaped the hall without being frozen. They raised the alarm to the outer guard in the community, that the king is under attack in the great hall. Isatar took long steps and strode out of the hall, continuing his narrative as he went. But what did he find? This person who escapes. The compound is in chaos. The alarm has been sounded as a giant with two heads has ripped down the outer fence and is tossing the garrison on the wall of poor dogs. Guards are rushing to the perimeter while screams pierce the night and the horn and the watchtower is being sounded. He stepped out toward the center square and continued on. The spectacular attack by this monstrous two-headed giant creates an urgency and all scramble to find bows, fire, weapons, whatever they can to repel the attack. And a lone figure, one who peaceably entered the great hall, and for whom none other know the magical death that was wrought within that great house, slips out and away, and lets its monster wreak havoc upon the cavern. Isatar looked around the compound as if he could see it all, as if he were there and could hear the screaming and the shouts, the death and destruction of that awful night. And certainly, if it had retired or was driven off, the creature came back another night, or nightly, until the population ran short of fighting men and women. The regular town folk scattered off to somewhere, anywhere but here. And then later, upon seeing the pit fire that we set burning again, and the smoke and sparks flying into the heavens, the giant beast returned again to make another deadly appearance. But this time, the death was its own. I could see his eyes drop down from looking far out and away to the smoldering dead form of the two-headed troll. Clearly, the giant was not simply encouraged to come here and attack, I said, and it wasn't just looking for a meal like some feral predator. This was a concerted effort, coordinated, planned, which means Isatar was following my reasoning that our magical dealer of frozen death also can exert control upon wicked beasts to do their bidding. Do you know of such a figure? A wizard steeped in the lore of ice and creatures. Are there any legends or accounts of such a personage? This is the far end of the Silver Mountains. I shook my head. Beneath us is not well settled in the Dwarf Forge. Almost wildlands. Well, we'll have to forge ahead ourselves. And we have a torn down wall and a northward trail to follow. Shall we? I had my axe my friend to avenge, and my best companion to do it with. We shall, I said firmly. And so we started off. Beginning at the smashed section of the wall, we made our way north, following a very easy trail of footprints made in the snow and loose rocks. I noted again that along the way back, there was no evidence of blood or bones scattered along the way. 
So this was not a foraging for food, as is common among trolls to human dwellings, but simply to cause death and destruction, and going a long way in order to effect it. Further proof that this monster was doing the bidding of a controlling force, and not just acting according to its nature. As we continued north, we traveled further up the mountain as well. The snow became more prevalent, and the breeze grew more chill as we went. I started to wonder if we had more than a day's march ahead of us, and if we shouldn't have carried more supplies and food. But then I remembered the short time it took for the creature to arrive at the town from when we started the fire. We climbed for a few hours more, and the sun peaked in the sky and began its descent when we came up to an area which leveled off and revealed a round cave opening. The tracks led right up to it. I drew my axe, and Isotar drew both his sword and curved sword, and we approached with caution and wary eyes. To our surprise, there was a figure sitting upon a boulder just outside the entrance. A small, girlish figure with blonde hair in braids and wearing simple hides and a fur wrap. She smiled as we approached, and I felt a bit awkward with our show of weapons, but we had no idea what the dark maw yawning open in the side of the rock face contained. I was told to wait for you, she said in a cheerful child's voice. I'm glad it wasn't long. She slipped off the boulder and headed to the cave opening. Follow me, please, she said, and disappeared into the darkness. I glanced at Isotar, who stared for a moment, then pointed with each of his swords to one side and then the other of the cave opening, and I nodded. Each of us stepped up to one side, with our backs to the wall of the cave, and cautiously stepped into the darkness. We shuffled in sideways, and each took a moment to let the bright light reflecting off the snow stop dazzling our eyes and let the darkness fade into a dull grayness. We could hear the steps of the child echo inside the large cave, and we continued forward cautiously, but picked up our speed to keep up with our guide. We continued to slope downward, but as we did, and the opening of the cave disappeared within the twists and turns of the cave, the light in the cave never turned totally dark. I became aware that the sides of the cave were covered in ice, and the ice itself held a very faint glow or reflection to it, which kept the darkness at bay. I gave a short hiss to Isotar to get his attention, and then knocked on the walls to point this out to him. He slowly nodded, and his brow furrowed, and we continued on. At length, we heard at the same time a bubbling and dripping sound. The cave widened out and became brighter with more reflection within the chamber we approached. What we beheld was a hot spring with a churning pool of bubbling water in the center, and steam filled the entire cavern. Above the hot spring were giant icicles pointing down and dripping water running off their ends back into the pool. A wide ledge wound around the right side of the pool and led to an opening on the far side. Careful of your feet here, the child thing said. It's slippery, and I'd hate for you to fall in. We shuffled along uneasily on the ledge, our guide waiting patiently at the opening for us. There, we were ushered into a larger chamber, whose walls and ceilings were covered in thick ice and frost, but the floor remained bare dry rock. Formed out of ice at the end of the cavern was a raised ledge with a sitting chair, also made of ice. Seated upon the ice throne was a human-appearing woman of great age, sporting large, spiked antlers. She wore no clothing, but her body was smeared with ash and bluish coloring in sigils and runes and swirls. Wait here, the small one said. Bragda, I swore under my breath. What's this? Isotar asked, puzzled. We may have to switch tactics, I said angrily. The small child said something to the seated figure, 
who nodded slowly back. Approach, the child said, still cheerful, though slightly less so. Follow my lead, I said, as I stepped forward. Isitar fell in behind. We moved forward until we were halfway into the room, but still a respectful and safe distance away from the seated figure. Kneel and offer your weapons, I muttered to Isitar as I took a knee and placed my axe sideways in front of me. I am free sword, Isitar said. I have no lord. I kneel to no man. This is no man, I shouted as loud as I could in a whisper. He shrugged and bowed to his knee, placing both his swords crossed in front of him. You killed my child. Its blood is upon you, the child's voice said, no longer cheerful. She stood next to the throne and faced us, her face devoid of expression. Your child killed my friends, Kavayan, I responded. It was doing my bidding, the voice responded through the child. There are consequences even in service, I replied. True enough, the voice answered. What offense had our Lord Arn committed to suffer Kavayan's wrath? Isitar looked at me, puzzled, and I quickly shook my head. He has neglected the old ways. He spurned me and paid not his tithe. Need so many have paid for this slight? He is not alone in his transgression. And do not the people of a king share his fate, whether for good or ill? This is so. I would bargain for amends on his behalf, on their behalf. There was a silence. I counted this as a good sign. Amends had not been dismissed out of hand. For seven years he has affronted me. For seven years he will double his tithe. My subjects grow hungry, the child voice said. A fair price, I replied. Also, it said, and paused. I drew in a breath. This was going to be the hard part of the deal. I have lost a child. It must be replaced by Arn's seed. There was a thunderously quiet pause. My mind raced. King Arn has no heir. I will visit him. In another guise, he will replace my child. He is not dead? He is but in the sleep of the ice. He shall awake and show his fealty. Pardon, Isitar said haltingly. We attempted to awake one of his number. It resulted in disaster. Sprinkle this into a fire and place the king before it, and he shall awaken. The figure in the throne gave the child a small bag, who then quickly ran up and delivered it to me, and then went back to her place beside the throne. Do not awaken any others beside the king. He is to go fallow for a season, and perhaps then understand. All things came to pass that were pronounced in that chamber. Upon leaving the cave, Isitar was bursting with questions, and for most of them I had insufficient answers. King Arn was returned, as Kavan had described, and though he was distraught to hear the terms of twice the tithe to pay, he vowed that he should do so for the seven years described. It was decided between Isitar and I that we not tell him about replacing Kavayan's child. It sounded like she had a deception she intended to enact, and it would be best not to make mention upon it. We left with royal thanks, and it would be many years before Isitar and I returned to this part of the Silver Mountains again. You've been listening to Part 3 of Adventure in the Ice, a Dungeons & Damsels Fireside Adventure by Unchained Productions, written by David Ian. Voice talent by Karen O'Brien. Sound engineering by Dino D'Elfwell. Sound design by David Ian. Theme by Ron Perovich. Music by Mark Rose. Medieval music by Johnny Easton. Adventure in the Ice is a fireside adventure short story of the Dungeons & Damsels series by Unchained Productions.